All right, uh, looks like we're good to go. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 2. We're going to finish this up, this chapter up, Lord willing, and start into the next one this morning. We're in Revelation looking at the letters to the seven churches. This is how Revelation begins. And um, so far, we've gotten through the church at Ephesus, the church at Smyrna, uh, the church at uh, Pergamos. And we're, this morning, we're going to look at Thyatira and Sardis. Now, um, each one of these letters have similarities. We've talked about these. Uh, they almost always come with a commendation and then a critique, if you will, uh, uh, a rebuke of sorts about what they're doing wrong. And only two churches in the list didn't receive any kind of rebuke, and that was the church of Smyrna and that, that's the church of Philadelphia. We haven't got to Philadelphia yet. But um, these are seven churches that are located in Asia Minor. They were real churches with real people, with real pastors, and, and, and uh, uh, in real time, contemporary to John's writing this. So it's important to remember that the things that are written here uh, were written to those churches. But it's, the, each one of these letters is concluded by saying, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And... What that, what that does for us is tell us there's another application to these. And that is an application that would be for all time, for all churches, for anyone that would hear, for anyone that's willing to listen, this is applicable toward you. So whatever interpretation we arrive at of these letters, we have to be sure, at least of those two things, that the interpretation that we're applying to it is going to apply first to that church that was in Asia Minor during the time of, of uh, the Apostle John. And we have to also be sure that it is also applicable to anyone who is willing to listen, any church for all time. Uh, any other application, any other interpretation that introduces other things into that might not fit that, might not uh, 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 accommodate those two things. Now, uh, the church in Thyatira starts in verse 18 of chapter 2. And it says, And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass. Now, before John received instruction on what to write, he saw a vision of Christ himself. And it was a vision so frightening that John passed out, laid on the ground like a dead man. And um, uh, Jesus encouraged him to get up, to not be afraid, and told him what he had something for him to do. Now, the, in the vision that he saw of Jesus, it, uh, uh, each one of these churches, it would seem uh, something in that vision was applicable to that church. And one of those characteristics, one of the traits that Jesus had in that vision was his eyes were flame of fire and his feet was like it, they glowed like molten brass would glow and uh, that's how he identifies himself to this church to be honest what and even with Pergamus do you remember what Pergamus was doing wrong they had the doctrine of Balaam which Balaam was a was a character a prophet that was willing to prophesy whatever someone wanted when they had the money to pay for it they were a preach a prophet for hire that was willing to even curse God's people if the price was right. And we there's a lot of churches that are like that today. That the pastors or in leadership are willing to do whatever as long as they get the money to uh, to their bank account. And uh, so there's many that have the doctrine of Balaam, but Jesus was presented to them as having a sword that comes out of his mouth, and that was part of his warning was. If you don't straighten up, I'm going to come see you with my sword. I'm going to, you know, you're going to have the, the bad end of my sword if you don't straighten it up. And uh, that would be a frightening vision. But it would also be frightening to see Jesus personified as having flames in his eyes. And uh, I don't know about the bronze feet. That doesn't frighten me nearly as much as the flames in his eyes. That would, that would to me, communicate... Intense anger and displeasure. Um, but that's how he is presented to this church. 
I know thy works in charity and service and faith and patient in thy works. Do you notice something peculiar about that? He says works twice. I know thy works. And then he names charity, patience, and so forth. And then he says, and thy works. Why does he mention works twice? Well, he explains it in the following statement. And the last to be more than the first. He begins with works. Then he names some of them. Then ends with works. And basically the indication is their works have increased. They're doing more than they were doing at the beginning. They're doing better than they were doing at the beginning in that respect. Uh, They they don't lack in service. They don't lack in uh, the things that you should see a church doing. They're doing all those things. Uh, Faith, patience, charity, service, all of those things. And they're doing more of them than what they were doing at the very beginning. Uh, they were a working church, a church that was a growing church spiritually. Um, so they had that going for them. But in verse 20, it says, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, it's very doubtful. There was a woman there that was actually named Jezebel. I'm pretty sure that Jesus in this instance is using the name Jezebel to, as, uh, to characterize this person. And there is a woman in the church that calls herself a prophet, prophetess. You know, that's a dangerous thing. And I, I see that even to this very day uh, where people will advertise and call themselves either prophet or prophetess. Now, there are. Certainly people back in that day before they had a, a, a written copy of the Scripture. It was something that was very, very desirable. Because a prophet is someone that speaks to God on your behalf and hears from God on His behalf to tell you know, the, 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 the hearer. So when you have a people that want to hear from God that would enjoy, would, not just would enjoy, but would, would appreciate that contact, that connection, they would appreciate the presence of a prophet. And that's one of the things why that would be appealing. Um, Depends on, I guess, the person too. Some people, it seems to be immature believers would think that would be appealing. Um, At least I would think so, that mature believers might say, you know what, I'm not sure if I'm prepared to hear what God has to say about my life because I'm already aware of a lot of things that aren't right. And I already know those things are going to be brought to my attention. And, um, you know, it might not be a... Pre- and it very seldom is. I mean, the things that Jesus says to these churches, He, he gives some kind of, uh, commendation, but there's also a lot of rebuke along with it. And, uh, but, but usually... People think they want to hear from God. They want a word from Him. And so that's why this thing with prophets is appealing. And so all somebody has to do is come around, put on a good show, that they're getting a word from God, they're getting a message from God and to deliver to His people, and they want to hear it. And oh, praise God, because it's usually a wonderful message. It's usually a great message when it's a fake and a phony. Very seldom do God's prophets deliver good news. It just never has been that way. Uh, um, it's usually always bad news that prophets have to deliver uh, because it's just because the, the behavior of the people. That's, it requires it. Um, but the prophets that come along and claim to hear a word from God that uh, you're special and that God wants you to succeed and God wants you to prosper and God wants you to be rich and wealthy and happy, um, of course you want to hear from that prophet. That's why they're appealing. And that's, this woman was appealing in some way. She called herself a prophetess. No one else gave her that designation. It was one she gave herself, like many of them do. And what she was doing was teaching. What was she teaching? Well, first you need to find out who Jezebel is. And we should know, be familiar with that story. Uh, Back during the time of Elijah, the prophet Elijah, uh, the children of Israel... uh, 
had gotten involved into Baal worship. And the ringleader of that whole operation scenario was a woman named Jezebel who was closely aligned to uh, King Ahab uh, in, that, in that ordeal. And she was the one that would pull the strings and, and get Ahab to do her bidding. So uh, it was actually Jezebel that was running the country instead of the king, the king of uh, the, uh, the king of Israel, because he was doing whatever she told him. And she introduced Baal worship, and they wanted to. Eat, she wanted to even make it mandatory. Uh, and uh, so Elijah spent a good deal of time in hiding, because well, for one thing, he had warned Ahab, God's going to cause a famine, and then there was that. But but. Uh, at any rate, um, Jezebel, we have to get that into terms that would be, like I said earlier, that would be applicable to that original church and to be applicable to us as well. Now, in that early church even, Baal worship was not a problem. So if Jesus calls her Jezebel, we have to look for why would He characterize this woman as Jezebel? One of the things we know about Baal worship during the time of Jezebel was that it was widespread. And it was popular. It was what everybody was doing. We want Israel to do what everybody else is doing. We want Israel to be contemporary with the rest of the world. Uh, if you want Israel to proper, uh, prosper, you have to get with the program and, and make sure you're doing what the rest of the world is doing and adopt their, th their culture, their themes, their religion. That's what Jezebel was doing. Whoever was in this church that is characterizes Jezebel would have been doing the same thing. Would have been t teaching the people we have to get, we need to do what the world is doing. We need to do what is popular right now. We need to do, if we hope to grow and if we hope to prosper, we need to appeal to the world. And to appeal to the world, we have to adopt worldly practice. I think it's safe to assume that that's probably the way Jezebel's message was going in that church to Thyatira. That's how it would apply to them. And you can see it would very much apply to us today. Uh, the churches, uh, uh, not just in America, but abroad, wherever. Um, this seems to be a very popular method. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, to, uh, to adopt. And um, the message of the church is outdated. So we need to modernize it. We need to make it contemporary. And we need to adopt the practices of the world to make the church more appealing. I would think that that would be very much like her message. Especially, it's okay, by the way. I'm not talking about an, an aversion to change, period. An aversion to making things better. I'm not talking about that at all. Um, uh, what I'm talking about is when the practice is actually sinful. Um, the, he mentions uh, fornication. Now, she seduces them to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Was the fornication he talking about actual fornication or was it spiritual? Um, the, I'm inclined to think that it was spiritual because that's what idolatry is classified as. It's, it's a type or form of fornication because um, it usually the idolatry involves an appeal to pleasure in some sort. That's not to say they did not have temple prostitutes in that day for certain temples. It's my understanding that the temple of Aphrodite, that's the way that it was set up. It was set up to be a temple slash, uh, uh, what do you call that? Bordello type thing or whatever. But um, at any rate, I, I don't think that was necessarily here in Thyatira. It could have been. But I think that the message here is it's speaking primarily of the idolatry that's involved. And um, uh, committing fornication and eating things sacrificed to idols, those two things, are, of course, are associated with um, idolatry. Now, it says in verse 21... He gave her space. I gave, he says, I gave her space to repent of her fornication and she repented not. Now, what does that mean? Space to repent. Um, it means what you would think it means. You know, God didn't judge right away. But there's an interesting passage in Psalms. It's Psalms 50. 
And I wanted to read a portion of that with you because it does seem to fit very well. In Psalm 50, starting with verse 16, it says, And God is speaking unto the wicked. It says, But unto the wicked, God saith, What hast thou to declare my statutes, or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth? So he's speaking of someone that's wicked, speaking of someone that's declaring his statutes, and, de and, and declaring his covenant. Now that would kind of a fit a false prophet, would it, wouldn't it? A wicked person that's declaring the, the truths of God. And God is saying, what, what do you, what do, who are you to be declaring my statutes? Who are you to be speaking of my covenant? Seeing thou hatest instruction, and thou castest my words behind thee. So who are you to be speaking God's words whenever you don't even care about the words that I'm speaking. You, don't, you cast them behind you. Uh, you step ahead uh, of my statutes and my words and my commands. And then he goes on to say, when thou sawest a thief, then thou consentest with him and hast been made partaker with adulterers. Now that's an interesting passage and it could be an uncomfortable passage, I suppose. Um, what he says about the wicked here is that when you saw a thief, you consented with him. How did you consent with a thief? Well, you consented when you didn't say anything about it. When you didn't do anything about it, you consented with it. And, and how, it doesn't say that you are a thief when you do that it just explains you've been made a partaker in his deeds when you don't say anything when you don't speak about it and i think that when you look at modern culture and and at least how it's changed there were some good changes but there was there are some very very bad changes and uh one of those things are that that uh uh, the things that we would observe and the things that we would put up with without saying anything about it is oftentimes it's, it's terrible. Uh, I'm not talking about actual adultery that we would view. I don't think any one of us would want to do that, but it comes on the television and we accept it. We don't say anything about it. We don't point out that, hey, this is bad, but that's not a good thing. Uh, we should warn if it, if it involves a, a, a something that is displeasing to God, we certainly shouldn't watch it as if it's normal, as if it's nothing. And, and people do that today, like with the television. I, I can't think of a... Um, I mean, it's very, very rare that you have a television program uh, where there's a family portrayed and the wife and the husband are faithful to each other. Uh, it, it's, it's usually, you know, one of them's gone, one of them's absent. Or they, you know, and we we accept this. We accept couples moving in together without being married and behaving as if they're married. We accept this as normal. Uh, God is saying this is not good, and you've made you're making yourself partakers of these things. But He's talking about the evil, by the way. That I means, excuse me, the, the 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 wicked. But in seeing this, we should also be warned by it that that uh, whenever we see something that is wicked, something that is evil, we should, we should not be silent uh, lest, we, uh, lest that be interpreted as consent. Now he says also, Thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit. The kind of people that he's talking about there are the kind of people that speak lies. Have you ever known somebody that would lie when it's beneficial to tell the truth? It might even be easier, but they would rather lie. I don't understand that. Um, not to say I've always spoken the truth. Lord knows I've told my share of my own. But, but uh, there are some people that are like that, that they lie. And then when it turns out that their lie is found out, well, then they have to frame it. They have to prop it up, give it some supports so that they can well know that this is what I meant by that. And... They keep the lie going and they keep it supported and they keep it propped up even though it's a lie. Even though it would be so liberating to just say, you know what, that was not true. Here's the truth. Yeah. 
I, I was watching, um, I, don't want, I, I don't like to get into politics too much, uh, but uh, uh, I don't even know how to say her name. I know there was a big deal about saying her name improperly. I have no idea how to say Kamala. Is it Kamala or Kamala? I don't know. But, but at any rate, someone was asking her in a news episode about how strongly she came against Biden as being a uh, pervert and a, uh, I don't know the word now, the, uh, uh, oh, not a, he didn't, she didn't say womanizer, but uh, basically uh, uh, the accusation was that he was a, uh, uh, someone you wouldn't want to be alone with, in other words. Um, and these charges were were like like Bill Cosby level of not you know you don't want to be alone with this guy. Can you trust him? That that kind of a thing. That's the way they were in the Democratic debates. Kamala was coming against him in such a manner that 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 he you, you can't trust him because uh, look at his behavior around women. Look at his behavior around children. It's bizarre. It's weird. She didn't say those things, but that's you know the the vibe that the the, the uh, the gist of what she was saying. Well, anyways, the, the news reporter, after she's the vice president for Biden, then asks, well, what about all those charges you made against Biden during the debate? During the debate. And she just laughs and laughs and says it was a debate. Well, then he reiterated, what, what did you not mean what you were saying? Or was you not, you know, was you not being honest during that time? Or do you just... Are you just overlooking it now because he selected you to be the vice president? What's the deal? And she just laughs and laughs. It was a debate. So in other words, it, it, I was lying. But she wouldn't say that. She's going to frame it and try to prop it up so that it's acceptable in a debate to attack people with things that are false. Or, I guess that's what she was saying. I don't believe it was false, but... At any rate, that's an example of how you would frame deceit. You frame it up so that when it's attacked, when it's apparent that it's not true, you still try to hold it up. You frame it in this way. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother, thou slanderest thine own mother's son. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Now that's where we get to the point about space. Space to repent. Now, the wicked have done all these things. The wicked have done horrible things. But they haven't heard from God. It's like a, a child. I can remember when Levi was little. He would do something he knows he's not supposed to do, and he would watch you while he was doing it. You know, to see if he was going to get away with it. If you were going to do something about it. People do that with God. They'll do what they're going to do. They know he's against it. They know he's opposed to it. But they'll do it anyway and see if something happens. And if nothing happens, it's like, whew, all right, got, got away with it. No, he didn't. He says, these things thou hast done, and I kept silenced. Thou, excuse me, silence. Thou thought that I thoughtest that I was altogether such an one as thyself. See, you thought God is telling the wicked. You thought when I was silent that your behavior was just excused. You thought that I was going to say I'm going to do something, but then I wouldn't do it. You thought I was like you. When, and you thought silence, my, His silence was consent. But it isn't. God's silence is not consent. God's silence is space for you to change your mind. Change your ways. He's waiting for you to change. But he says, but I will reprove thee. What that means is judge. Try. You're going to trial. And set them in order before thine eyes. Set what in order? What is them? These charges. He's going to set all your charges in order before your face, before your eyes. You didn't get away with it. Just because God failed to punish you for it, just because God failed to judge you for it, doesn't mean you got away with it. That's just, this is what He did with Jezebel. He, he gave her space to repent. There was silence, but it wasn't consent. She hadn't got away with what she had done. 
The wicked are that way. And sometimes the righteous get discouraged when they see wicked people get away with wicked things. Well, they haven't gotten away with it. They're going to be judged of God and they're going to see those charges rise up before their face. So no one gets away with anything. It's not going to happen. Now, um, he goes on to say, Behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Early on, we I mentioned briefly about the ages, the church ages, and this uh, uh, flies in the face of all that. Uh, the Bible speaks of a great tribulation uh, unlike the world has ever seen or will ever see. And here we have a great tribulation mentioned, which indicates this type of church, at least, is going to exist up until the end time. Because he's telling them that, that uh, uh, they're going to go into great tribulation except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, which, by the way, that's the way people use, usually excuse behavior, is by digging a little deeper and getting involved in some philosophy and trying to justify your behavior. Uh, he calls it here the depths of Satan. It's, it, you're just trying to delve into something deeper and it leads to nowhere. I will put upon you none other burden. And he gives, and he gives what he's telling them, what he's instructing them to do. He says, but that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. So he tells them to what they have, hold on to it. What they have that is good, hold on to it. Don't let go until I come. He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him I will give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and as vessels of potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received to my Father. And I will give him the morning star, and he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Now Jezebel is probably giving them instruction on how to be great. Giving them instruction on how to bring in the masses. What Jesus is telling them, if you hold on to what you have that is true and right, you don't worry about bringing in the masses. He's going to give them uh, a rod of iron. He's going to allow them, he's going to give them power over the nations. We have a little more time. I hope we have enough time to cover Sardis. Um, <clears throat> if not, we'll finish it ne ne next week. Now, in verse 1, it says, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and are dead. That is a very sobering charge. And Sardis is one church that Jesus has nothing good to say about. What a terrible predicament. Can you imagine you're in that first century and you get delivered these letters from the Apostle John and it's a word from Jesus and you're getting to read about all these other churches. Imagine you are the church at Sardis. You are that church. And you're reading about Ephesus and you're like, ooh, I wouldn't want to be that church. They lost their first love. And Pergamus is... I don't want to be involved in that doctrine of Balaam. That's bad stuff. Don't want to be like Thyatira and allow that Jezebel. I'm glad I'm not them. And then you get to your church and it says you're dead. There's no life in you. Wow. What a sobering experience that must have been. And Jesus is saying, I don't have anything good to say about you. Goodness gracious. What a horrible, horrible predicament. What does it mean? Well, they had a name that they li lived. You know, Sardis was in a valley. I forget the name of the valley, but it was a very fertile place. So it was ideal for a civilization or a city or, or growth in that manner. I don't know what all else pertained to the city, but they had a reputation. This church had a reputation for being alive, but they were actually dead. Uh, they apparently were going through the motions, but they had no life in them. Uh, uh, I was discussing this with my family on the way here. So something that I ponder in my brain is what is life? How do you define life? What is the difference between life and death? 
Well, the only thing I can come up with, the only thing I can think up with, is, is one of the, uh, the attributes of life that you find in common with all things living is that there is self-replication. Uh, uh, like, like if you have a live body, there's cells in that body. And those cells are constantly reproducing themselves to replace the old cells that, that die off. Uh, when you see a, um, a heavenly body, like a star, uh, a live star is a star that's active. And it's, it's constantly uh, um, uh, producing uh, light, radiation, and heat uh, just over and over and over constantly. But you see a dead star and it's not doing anything, just sitting there. Same as a planet. You take a planet like uh, Mercury, for example. It's a dead planet. There's no life there. There's nothing happening. But you look at a planet like ours, like Earth, there's all kinds of activity going on. But it's not just activity. Because if it was, you could take a dead body and just wave their arms and they're alive again. But that, we know that's not so. Because there's nothing internal that is moving. There's nothing internal that's growing. There's nothing internal that's, that's working. Uh, it's it's uh, the same uh, uh, temperature as, the, as, the, as, it, as your environment. Uh, uh, that was one of the observations that Christine had. But, uh, the, all these things pertain to life. And I would say that it, it, then the, that church, it would probably be, be the same way. That, that this is a church that if they had growth, it wasn't real growth. If they had growth, it was probably growth in numbers, but not growth in newborn believers, new born again believers. Um, there was some life there. There was something still alive. It's as if there's a corpse there and there's still, there's no breath, but there's still a faint heartbeat. There's some things there that can be attended to bring things back to life. And you know, we're like that in our own personal way. You know, you can resist God. You can walk away from God so long that your heart becomes numb to His instruction. Your heart becomes numb to His conviction. But there might be an ember there. If you belong to Him, there is one. That if you fan it a little bit, then you, you, you can bring it back. You can bring things back. Um, he goes on to say that uh, to be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that they that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. And one of the things he tells them is to repent. He says, remember therefore, therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come on thee. You know, one of the things he said to the other church is hold on to what you have. And here he's telling them to repent, but he's telling them to remember, to strengthen those things that remain, and remember where, from where it was that you fell from, and repent. Um, you know, one of the charges that we get from Christ, at least from some of the churches, is that he would remove his candlestick. You know, if a person, if you're listening today and you're not in church, you're not involved in a church, um, that you're, you're certainly not part of that life. You're not contributing. I'm not talking to you folks here this morning, but those that might be watching that aren't going to church. Um, wherever their church is and if they are a member of a church, that's, you know, they're... They've already accomplished the very thing that Christ is warning them against. Uh, they're, they're not there. They're, you, you know, they're, not, uh, they're not contributing anything at all to the church. It's just like having a dead appendage. You know, nobody wants to have a body with a dead hand. You know, necrosis sets in. That's what, you know, and it becomes dead and it's good for nothing. And the only thing you can do is chop it off. Who wants to be that? Why would a person want to be that to a local church? You, and the thing of it is, people say, well, I am the church. I'm saved. A church is an assembly. There's no separating the meaning of those words from the church. It's an assembly. And to have an assembly, it's a group. You can't have a group if you're not grouped together. You can't have an assembly if you're not assembled. If you're not part of a church, then these instructions to the, to the churches, you're, you're already in that category of... Uh, the, the, you know, being in the place that he's warning against. 
He says, uh, remember and repent. You know, and there's something about repentance. Repentance is not easy. It depends on what it is, too, we're talking about. Um, it's not always easy. It's easier said than done. Uh, I've, I've uh, talked to people before, and I've even been there myself, uh, that were in tears because they knew that they were doing things that were displeasing to God, but they didn't, they didn't see, they loved it too much, and they didn't see a way to stop it. I firmly believe this, what I'm fixing to tell you, and I don't have Scripture to back it up this morning, per se, but I firmly believe that every step you take to God, He takes two toward you. That when it comes to our salvation, there's literally nothing that we can do to, um, uh, to accomplish that except belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, but when it comes to our discipleship, our walk, we can really mess that up badly. And we can go way away from God to where our life is just like that church is dead. And there's no production. There's nothing happening uh, toward godliness and toward godly things. And it's just dead. Um, it's a hard thing to repent sometimes. Um, but you know, I think that there's something that you can do. There's something that we can do. For me, I remember in my life, I backslid for a great, great long time. And then when the Spirit really gripped my heart and showed me how, where I had fallen from, I was that way. I was like, you know, I, I don't know that I can stop all this. But there was one thing that I felt I could do. And I found it easy enough. I did it all the time. I could get in my vehicle and drive somewhere. I would go to the movies. I would go to the you know, the, the stores or whatever. I would go to be with, uh, hang out with friends or whatever. Why couldn't I go get in my vehicle, drive to church? I could do that. And I said, you know what? I feel hopeless and helpless and everything else, but this one little tiny thing I believe I can do. So let's do that and see what happens. And God got a hold of my heart and began to change me in ways I didn't even know was possible. And, but just because I took a step in that direction, and it's like, okay, that's all he needed, and he carried me the rest of the way. And, and this is why repentance is so important, and it, it's also hard. But it, all, it goes back to that thing I showed you, I shared with you about Apollo 13, and I love how, they, how Gene Kranz, the operator, tried to guide everybody to look at that uh, disaster. Let's stop looking at everything that's broke. Let's go with what's good. What can we do with this spacecraft? And you need to do the same thing with your life. What is good? What's not broke in my life? What good can I do? What thing can I change? And you do what you can with what you have. And the, and the miraculous thing is that God can come into your life and do things that you never even knew was possible that you could do. Amen. But it comes from repentance. And it's a hard, hard thing. Now He tells them that He's going to come on them as a thief, and they won't know what hour they will come. I know I'm a little bit over, but I want to finish this. The, uh, uh, there's no shortage of predictions over when Jesus is going to return. Is there not? I mean, someone will come along and say, oh, it's 1994. I remember that one. And someone would say, oh, it's the year 2000. That's uh, uh, got the Bible's timeline. We got two thousand years up to the flood, two thousand years after the flood, two thousand years uh, after Christ, and then we're going to have the last thousand years is going to be the millennial reign. So that's seven thousand years. That's God's number for completeness. So two thousand, Jesus is returning. Well, you know, Jesus was very clear when he spoke to his disciples, including John. Um, that uh, he was going to come on them as a thief. And I apparently lost the scripture. Oh, shoot. Well, I didn't copy my reference. It's in Luke. I could have swore that I just did that. But it's in Luke. And what he says in Luke is that um, if the strong man of the house knew when the thief was coming, he would prepare for it. And he tells his disciples to always be ready to watch. That's what he tells the church at Sardis. To watch. Always watch. You know that church in Sardis, I'm sure, 
for years was expecting Jesus to return. He did return for them individually. But the church in every age is supposed to expect Jesus to turn, return. We're supposed to expect it right now. And uh, even today, it could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be next year. But one thing we can be certain of is that no one knows the hour. Uh, the Son of Man, He says, comes in an hour when you think not. So the only thing that can be determined by saying the year 2000 is when Jesus is returning, the only thing that can be determined by that is that's when He's not coming. If you say it's going to be 1994 on March 10th or whatever, we can know that day is not the day. It might be the one ahead of it, it might be the one behind it, but it's not going to be that one because Jesus said, no one knows the hour. I'm going to come in a time when you think not. I'm right out of time, so I'm not going to get to finish Sardis. Lord willing, we'll get to get, it, uh, get into that. I wanted to uh, speak more about the book, the book of life. And uh, we'll stop there at verse 4. But you know what? We're going to go ahead and read the read, read that. If I I'm going to, I'm going to gloss over it, and maybe we'll go back and uh, go in more detail. He says, "Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, that have not devoured their garments, and they walk with me in white, for they are worthy." And then he says, "He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit has said." under the churches. Now, someone might look at that and say, well, here it is. It says right here that you can get your name blotted out of the book of life. There is a, a much to explain about that, and Lord willing, I'll get into that next Sunday. But I wanted to go back to the overcomer. Because each one of these ends the same way, and I don't want to get too far away from that, uh, what he says here. If there's ever a question of whether or not you're an overcomer, or whether you can overcome these obstacles, if should you experience them, uh, John gave us a, didn't give us a clue. He just said it straight out. Who will, who are the overcomers? Who are the people that's going to win in the end of it all? Uh, who is Jesus talking about when he says, "He that overcometh"? John says, "For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith." Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? That defines an overcomer. It's just faith in Christ. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's who you are. You're an overcomer. And, and the, uh, the instruction that Jesus is giving certainly applies to us. Uh, but we can be certain that uh, uh, he says whatsoever is born of God, if you've been born again and born again and you have His Spirit in your heart, uh, you can be certain that you fall into this category. Let's go ahead and bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this time together and we thank You, Lord, for the instruction that You've given these churches. And I pray, Father, that You'd help us to be mindful of who it is that they apply to, not just these churches that they're written to, but to us, to, but to us as well. Lord, it's uncomfortable for us to consider which one of these churches do we closely align with? And Lord, I pray that You would help us to take heed and pay attention uh, to the instruction that You give each one of these churches that we might receive it also. Lord, we pray that if there's any listening today that don't know You and haven't trusted in You as uh, their Savior, I pray that they might repent of their wickedness and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ at this time. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.